All right, so our next variable is health. And uh, just a few quick things. Remember to keep breathing while you're doing your technique, your method. Sometimes you just get so focused and excited, um, you're anxious about getting the call, that you hold your breath. Well, just basically just keep on breathing. In fact, that's why a lot of times I, uh, I like to talk while I'm doing it, because it ensures that I am breathing. Um, especially while I'm teaching, as I'm pointing out things. So I know I'm never holding my breath when I'm doing that kind of thing. Um, another thing is always make sure that you know your, your joints are well protected. And one of the ones I'm especially talking about is the knee that you're kneeling on, that you have some kind of pad to protect that knee. I mean, really don't try to be like uh, macho or egotistical about it where you think you could just kind of work through it. If you're gonna keep on doing this and do it for a long time, you really have to protect your knee. Uh, you don't wanna get spurs or anything like that. You don't wanna accidentally damage it. Um, it's a very important joint that you need throughout your whole life. I know, because I work in an emergency room. And uh, especially, you need your knees for like martial arts training, things like that, especially just for normal function, walking and whatnot, plus, uh, uh, as you get older, your joints are going to start aching anyway. Well, don't send it on its way earlier. So protect your knees uh, while you're doing this method in, in these positions. Always try to wear shoes if you can. I mean, in general, especially if you're in your workshop. When I was working at the nature school, people like to walk around barefoot because they like to be, well, natural. And we would constantly tell them, look, we're... Uh, where we're working, there's a lot of tools around, there's stuff sticking out of the ground, there's poison ivy, there's a lot of hazards for your feet. So um, we say that you should keep your shoes on um, because we don't want to take you to the hospital, especially me. I don't want to take you to the emergency room because I work there and I, I don't want to go there when I don't have to and, and uh, sit there in the waiting room or in a room for you, for you to get fixed. When we asked you already to wear your shoes, and now you need a tetanus shot and you're, uh, you're testing your health insurance. Hopefully you have health insurance, things like that. So avoid injuries and uh, wear your shoes. Um, your pressure hand brace should be really comfortable. And one of the things that I always like to do with all my pieces is I like to round things off, if you notice. I just quickly put them on the um, belt sander and especially the pressure hand brace. There shouldn't be like sharp edges on here while you're bearing down on this thing and trying to hold it in place because you're squeezing it even harder. And the harder you squeeze it, if there's like an edge on here, well you're squeezing that edge right into your hand and your fingers and it's really not comfortable at all. So uh, round off all the places where there's an edge on your uh, pressure hand brace, I always say. Okay, and something that may never happen, but uh, it's a pet peeve of mine. I remember once trying to demonstrate on uh, a sidewalk of concrete. Okay, and some of the things that I saw, and some of the things that I seen happen, is that people will be bowing and they'll be scraping their knuckles up against the, the concrete floor and their hands would be like bloody and raw. So um, watch your surface area that you're doing this on and uh, just be very careful about that. Always make sure your area is clear of anything dangerous too. Um, know where your knife is at all times. And some people uh, we used to see stuck their knife in the ground and sometimes what would happen is those people that we told to wear shoes would walk by and they would literally walk their, between their toes and their foot in, in these knives that are sticking out of the ground. Um, seems like a cool thing to do, but really it's not safe. So fold up your knife, put your knife in the sheath, whatever it is, put it back on your belt, put it in your pocket, or just lay it in, on the ground where it can be seen if you're going to use it. But make sure it's it's done safely. So our wood uh, core two is going to be sotal, which as you know is kind of really a, a giant yucker. 
So it's already been mated. The bottom has been flattened. The brace end is identified, sodal, and marked. Okay. Our pressure hand brace is also a piece of sodal, a uh, section that I wasn't going to use. This is actually a piece of how sodal looks when it's been sitting out in the weather for a little while. It's a little weathered. And uh, it can be thicker than this. This section here is only uh, an inch and a quarter. But it can get much bigger than this. It can get like uh, almost two inches from the, all the way at the base. Okay. So let's light this up. Let's put our cold transfer device down. I got the notch facing toward you again. Okay, we're gonna string this, we're gonna touch, tuck under the brace end, grab the back of the bow, and lock it, grab the cord and spindle, get in position, pick up the pressure hand brace, okay, get everything locked, my forearm is locked against my shin, my hand is locked up against above my ankle, my arm is nice and straight, so that all I have to do is slide forward if I want to add pressure. Okay, everything's at 90 degrees. So we're going to start off with a few slow strokes. There's that unilateral force that I'm pushing. Get that more stable. Hmm. Let's see. I'm going to change my pressure hand brace to the soapstone because I don't think that's really holding it in place. that unilateral force to push the base, I think I'm going to wear a shoe. Hold that in place. All right. Shoe is on. A little bit more stability. Now, sodal, like a yucca, is really easy to light up. Now that we're started, we're using all of our cord, and I'll bet we have a cord already. Yes, we do. Doesn't take long for sodal and yucca because it's so low density. Okay. Hold that in place, roll the board. And there's our coal. Next one is energy. Let's keep going. All right, so our next one is energy. And uh, the set that we're gonna be using is gonna be a uh, saguar. So here's some saguar uh, ribs that I talked about before that come off the cactus. These are some large ribs, some large rib sections. But some of them, smaller cactuses, their ribs are smaller. So you can make a large spindle, okay? And with the smaller ribs, you can make a smaller spindle, almost like hand drill, mouth drill size. And so the one that I'm using is really small. 
this one is uh, 3 8 of an inch in diameter and uh, 5 inches tall or about 13 centimeters tall. Okay, so we're going to put these back. Now, energy. Um, really, the cord is what binds around the spindle to transfer the energy um, to make this thing rotate and spin, right? So we're talking, a lot of this is transference of your energy into the set through another device instead of you just using your hands, which is really what the bow drill set is all about compared to the mount drill and the hand drill. Um, so some important points are Again, keeping that bowl level if you have store-bought cordage and keeping the bow on an angle, but a uh, level angle, okay? Not like riding up and down like this um, so that the cord doesn't touch itself, okay? It's going to stay in that S pattern, all right? Very important. Um, so we're not riding up and down this way. We're either keeping it level or we're keeping it at an angle and level, moving back and forth if it's natural cordage. Uh, gripping the cord if it's too loose is a technique you can use. So here on this bamboo bow, I if I were to uh, cord the spindle, okay. Now if I'm bowing and this starts to get a loose, uh, a little loose. One of the things I can do is go from the handle and choke up a little bit because the space that's created by the bow, you see there's a space here between the cord and the bow. I could uh, do a few things. One is if there's a really good space in between here, okay, like this, if this bow is really deep, I could grab, choke up and grab the cord like this and that'll tighten the cord a little bit around the spindle. Now, if this is really loose, what you should do is stop, make yourself stop, and retie the whole thing down so that it is the perfect tension. Okay, that it needs to be, it needs to be in balance. Now, if you're bowing and it's a good tension and it starts to just slip a little bit, try that little trick where you just grab, choke up, grab the cord. The other thing you can do too is pinch the cord this way so your fingers go up and your thumb goes down, okay, which adds more tension to the cord as well, okay. I usually try that trick too when I think things are starting to slip and I think I can, I'm very close to, to getting that call. But if it slips early, stop what you're doing and retie everything and just put it back in balance, okay. The other thing too is, is in the transfer of energy of uh, putting pressure down, all right? Now, you should try this exercise if you can. And that is, um, like when you do push-ups, okay? It's harder to stay in a push-up if your arm is bent, right? Because you're using your tricep muscle. This is really hard. To stay up like this but if your arm is straight okay it's, it's easier to stay in this position you can stay in this position for a really long time okay now in martial arts that's how we're taught to punch as well okay when you punch you don't hit the target okay if your arm is still bent your arm has to be all the way straight and then your body weight is behind it and your body weight goes down that uh, arm that's locked and there's your straw principle and that's when you're you transfer that energy through that strike well same principle goes for when you're sliding and you're adding pressure down the arm okay your arm is locked it's braced up against your leg okay it's braced up against your leg and all you have to do is lean forward a little bit and that pressure goes straight down that straight arm 
it's not bent because if your body weight goes here to your elbow, your elbow is going to do this instead of it just going straight down. All right. So very um, clear explanation as to uh, transferring that energy down that arm. Okay. So let's get started. Here's our saguaro. And uh, this is a flattened rib. Okay. It's already mated. The notch is toward you. And we have our little tiny spindle. And we're going to cord this spindle there. We're going to go ahead and use our soapstone pressure hand brace. And the base is small, so I'm going to leave my shoe on. And we're going to bring that back down to where it was. All right. Smooth strokes. It's warmed up, so we're going to do a little bit more speed. Not even a lot of pressure. Just speed and rotations. Because it's so, the diameter is so small, so it's slipping. So I'm going to pinch, I'm going to pinch the cord. A little bit. My base is breaking. Oh, we have a coal. Very good. We're just lucky because this is about to break. See that? It just broke off. But we got our coals in there. All right. All right. Next one. All right, so our next variable is chemical. And uh, one of the things that you should know is that uh, in areas uh, where there is uh, fire used for uh, clearing, and also in uh, states and other areas of uh, around the United States, at least, um, there is kind of a science that goes on for which trees you can plant around your home that are fire retardant, which means they resist catching fire should a fire uh, go through your, um, in your area. Um, places that are well known to have fires like Texas, California, things like that. So one of the recommendations that they uh, suggest <clears throat> are most of the judicious trees. Um, oaks, poplars, uh, fruit trees, uh, in fact, probably all the fruit trees, mulberries, cherries, um, apples, pears, all those hardwoods. And uh, it seems that they resist catching fire more than other trees. And trees that are low on the list, which are uh, seem to be accelerants when they catch fire, are things like pine or cypress or eucalyptus, because they have resins in them too. That once they catch fire, they're really gonna—they're just gonna go off. So we're gonna put that kind of in the back of our head and uh, keep that in mind. Um, so, uh, but this being the chemical section. Uh, what you'll really deal with, though, however, are either toxins and poisons, which you need to avoid. So you need to know your 
plant tree identification. Um, you know, things like cherry, when it's green, as soon as it dies, the uh, biomass of the material, like the leaves and things like that, all of a sudden they start to develop uh, cyanide uh, as a chemical within their, uh, within their biology. So you have to be careful about things like that. Uh, obviously, you'd be careful of uh, poison ivy, poison oak, poison sumac, which you've been mentioning throughout this media, throughout this den show, and things like that. But, uh, and when you go to the hardware store, you have to be careful kind of what you buy. And uh, the bamboo has the uh, polyurethane maybe on it, uh, like the, the spatulas. So you got to scrape or uh, sand all that stuff off. And uh, if you buy stuff at an arts and crafts store, sometimes it's kind of treated with a chemical. I saw that the bamboo that was at the, some of them, that was at the arts and crafts store, uh, was either dyed and it had uh, another polyurethane coating on it or something like that. So all that stuff has to kind of come off. Because you really don't want that stuff on there. You want stuff in as much as a natural state as you possibly can. So just to keep those in mind. So this broke off here. So what I'm going to do is uh, we're going to use this hole here, over here. All right, so we're going to fill that again a little bit. And I took out the dead space center already. And we're going to string our spindle again carefully. We let the pressure off the cord. Well, and take my shoe off. Let's see how we do. Some warm up strokes. bit more speed, some more rotations. All right, let's see what we got. Oh, nice cold. The other thing too about red, uh, Eastern Red Cedar, or most of the cedars, is they smell so nice. There we go. All right, so our next variable is moisture and humidity. Now, um, the thing about the bow drill is that because it allows for more pressure and you can get more speed and more rotations and you can work with a larger surface area, um, especially if you're working with a, a wood branch, you're better able to deal with conditions of high humidity as well as moisture itself and uh, back in the day when I used to teach at the nature school uh, I when I first started working there as an instructor I got handed the primitive uh, cooking lecture and you know where you cook on hot rocks and clay and spit cooking and uh, cooking over um, in an uh, oven and uh, steam pits, things like that. And when I first got that talk, it was a like 30 to 45 minute lecture on a marker board. And I realized that after I did that for a while, that I had an unbelievable 
number of questions because things couldn't be clear. I could explain it till I was blue in the face, but I figured out that what I really needed was to show some live examples. I mean, was it a picture is worth a thousand words? Well, one day I just happened to bring out a uh, clear glass uh, carafe, you know, for coffee and uh, filled that with water and I put hot rocks from a fire into the carafe and I made the water boil in the carafe and everyone could see it because it was clear glass. Well, I didn't have any questions because everyone could just see how it worked. So what I realized that I needed to do that with the entire lecture. So I took the entire class outside, but what I had done previously was over the, the day before, I had completely prepared cooking on coals, cooking on a spit, cooking on hot rocks, cooking in a steam pit, smoking meat, all of these things and more cooking in clay and uh, no one there was really no questions about anything because there it was and then we ate the food afterward uh, just as kind of a treat and it was really the best way to teach so from that metaphor um, our core two devices today are sycamore this branch which as you can see is flattened on both sides and this spindle okay which uh, is hollowed a little bit by myself okay and as you can see it is uh, marked and identified but here's what we're gonna do to prove my point ready one two three four five Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, very good. Now, this towel that I brought is to wipe off my hand and the excess moisture that's on there. Now, imagine you would never do that, right? With your set, ever. So, we're wiping off the excess. As you can see, our set was dunked. For about 10 seconds or maybe a little more right. so they're wet right I think I'm gonna wear a shoe just to keep it stable all right we're gonna use our soapstone pressure hand brace I'm gonna use my rattan bow the big one as you can see the notch for this one is directly on the side on the outside a little odd it'll be there okay so we string this in the usual fashion all right and we get in position and, and you know what I'm gonna do I'm gonna because it's a little high I'm gonna fill it with a little coal dust there. all right so let's get it warmed up Pressure, speed, rotations. Let's see what we got. We got us a big, huge coal. There we go. Oh, I really knocked that out. Again, you have time. Okay, it's oxidizing. And there you go. I think that proves scientifically my point. Next.
Okay, so our next variable is density and hardness. And again, uh, just because uh, we have to do things uh, scientifically with proof, um, I've chosen our core two devices to be oak. You're probably wondering when I was going to get around to something really hard. Well, here we go. We're just getting started, actually. Uh, you'll be absolutely amazed and surprised when we finally get to the toggle drill, which is the last drill device. Um, so what we have here is literally a uh, broom handle, broomstick, broom handle, okay, dowel, made out of oak. And here we have oak flooring. As you can see, it has the, uh, the um, manufacturing design in it already. So it's already mated, has a notch in it, all right? This is already uh, flattened after it's sphering, all right? And uh, this is now oak. This is now identified and marked as to which is the brace end. Well, that shouldn't be too hard to identify, but for safety. Uh, but I want to also show you these uh, oak pressure hand brace examples. Now this is the back end of a axe handle. Okay, even still has the sticker on it. Right? And uh, really comfortable grip. It's sort of flat. Remember I explained about that, the, the difference between the spear and the naginata. Well, this is kind of oval, and it's flat, but it's also kind of round, which makes it very comfortable, okay? I can get all my fingers around it. The hole is near the, the palm area of the, the wrist area of the palm, okay? This is a uh, piece of a large branch of oak that came from the Pine Barrens, and uh, there's your socket, all right? Now, remember, it's round so that it's kind of hard to tell if it's perpendicular or not. It even has uh, some uh, fungus like lichens growing on it. Alrighty. These oak pieces came obviously from the hardware store and uh, I think they're for like the tops of like stairs and things like that. Uh, what do you call the uh, on the stairway, the banisters, like the banisters have the pieces on them. So I think that's what these were for, and I, they were square with like sharp uh, corners. So I rounded all the corners off on the um, belt sander, like I like to do, not only to make it look better, but it's more comfortable so you don't have those sharp edges. And as you can see, it's perfectly flat. It's deep enough to hold the socket, okay? And here we just have uh, a section of oak that came from a piece of firewood. All right, as you can see, it's got a good lot, got a lot of good negative surface area there for your fingers. Keeps your fingers away from the socket hole. All right. So for our example, we're going to use uh, this one. All right. But we're talking about density. So one of the things that I didn't mention is what if you have something that's uh, really hard and a wood that's really soft. So let's say you have like a hardwood dowel hardwood spindle and you have a softwood base while the harder one the harder density is going to eat right through the softer one faster okay it's just going to go right through it so it may be able to work if uh, it doesn't eat it too quickly if there isn't such an extreme difference between the hardnesses um, because for example I can get a, a reed to work on some Atlantic white cedar if I get it just right. And the reed is really hard compared to the uh, Atlantic white cedar. And, uh, or I could do bamboo, which is a little harder than the cedar, things like that. But uh, when you start to get into real extreme, we're getting into extremes now with oak. Later I'm gonna show you examples of uh, cherry, uh, walnut, and even 
more dense and heavier than that, and you'll be really surprised. Because uh, Humphrey's equation theory, with all his uh, with the explaining the variables and things like that, has really made this really take off as a science and an art form, as you'll see later. All right, so uh, so you just have to be careful about the harnesses that you go with. So as best you can, you should always keep the core two devices either the same material which you have, if you're lucky, or keep the materials as close as a density as you can, as close to the same as you can. Okay. Also, as a reminder, oak is on that list of fire retardant trees that you would plant to prevent fires like around your home and things like that as well as other judicious trees and fruit trees but we're going to commit that to memory okay as we do this all right so we put our card coal transfer device under there just for luck and just to see what happens we're going to put a little coal extender in there. All right. Get in position. I think I'm gonna wear a shoe. This board is really wide. Where's our pressure hand brace? Position. Get some starter strokes going. Nice long strokes. Get it warmed up. And we're just going to keep going. Now this is very important. This is why I'm showing you the oak. Give me one second. Notice the the fuel. Can you see it? It's not powdery. It's not powdery at all. Okay. <clears throat> Let's take it apart a little bit. Right. Just to show you. Just bear with me here. Can you see the consistency of the fuel? Can you see it? It's not a dust. Can you see? They're actually much bigger than dust. Can you see that? I call them black striations. All right, they're like big chunks. It's not powder, it's not a dust. It's larger than that, all right? And that was our oak. Now what I'm gonna do is give you a heads up and tell you that when I do walnuts and cherry and hickory, I get the same fuel that looks like this, okay? In regards to density, all right? And there's no coal, you'll notice. All right, we're going to commit this to memory. We're going to assume that we're not going to get a coal with this at all. So I'm going to stop now, and we're going to move on to the next one. But we're going to remember this fuel and what happened 
with this wood density. All right, and I'm going to show you a couple other picks too of other examples. All right, on to the next. Okay, so our next variable is fuel. Uh, again, uh, fuel is one of the uh, three components of the fire triangle. Okay, temperature, air, and fuel. So for our demonstration now, uh, our pressure hand brace is again going to be our little soapstone. But I'm going to demonstrate this with the core two device of American chestnut. All right. Also, you should know that um, this did not have time to deteriorate uh, up in the tree. Um, this was cut by my neighbor in his backyard. And uh, so I have it. Uh, he didn't want it. So I put it all in my backyard for firewood. And uh, so this really hasn't even seasoned very much either. So, but we're going to give this a shot and we're going to Pay attention to what the fuel, the coal dust, looks like, okay? Get in position. We're going to use our rattan bow, our store-bought cordage, okay? Because this is a fairly uh, hard-density wood. We're going to use our... I got a brand new card there for a coal transfer device, but I really have it there for another purpose. It's all mated, it has a notch, and again the notch is on the side of the actual base. So we get this warmed up. So pressure, speed, rotations, pressure, speed, rotations. Keep going. Pressure, speed, and rotations. Okay, let's see what that looks like. Now, for a moment, it looked like something was there, right? You get a lot of that with woods of this hardness, of this density. So let's close up on that again. This is a very important lesson, which is why I'm showing you this. You're going to see this a lot with bow drill and woods of this density. Okay, what do you see? Sort of the same thing, right? Let's spread it out a little bit. OK, 
Can you see the size of those pieces? See how big they are? See how large they are? It's not dust. I'm going to give you a hint. Think back to when I talked about the TP fire. The fuel has to go up in size. Otherwise, the surface area is too large for it to catch. For example, you don't light a twig, right? You wouldn't light a, a little twig and then shove that underneath a big, huge log, right? You wouldn't take a little lit twig, like a match, and put it under a big, huge log. You wouldn't do that. That you know, almost instinctively, that that would never work because there's too much surface area. But that's one part of it. All right, we're going to commit this to memory, and we're going to move on. And that's our lesson for fuel. Here we go. Okay, so our next variable is containment or the notch. Um, some of the main points really are height of the notch where it takes too long uh, for you to keep going and have the notch fill. I mean the dust falls all the way down to the bottom of a high notch and it cools down and uh, it has to wait for it to entirely fill before it keeps the same temperature and ignite and start to oxidize and reach that critical temperature. So uh, we fill it with uh, something at least halfway, usually coal extender. You could fill it with a little bit of tinder, or you can even fill it with a little bit of uh, dry earth or uh, something of that nature, just to kind of uh, balance that out. Saves on your energy, saves on time, saves on your cord, saves on a little bit of frustration, and uh, just all around better. The other thing too is, is the size of your notch. And our set today, though, is going to be willow. Um, here are some spindles from some of that branch that we cut up earlier. Here are some Y bases, a whole bag of Y bases, which I have in here ready to use for another day. Okay. These are two boards that I used on the table saw off a large part of that branch, okay, and there are some Y bases that we've used in the past. Here's another branch, flattened on both sides and used once with this spindle here, okay. So this spindle here is uh, a little over 5 inches or about 14 centimeters approximately and approximately half an inch in diameter. Now this odd thing here is actually a pressure hand brace that we're going to use. Um, it's so big that I can get my hand around it, get my fingers around it, and uh, it's comfortable enough. It's a little odd. It's kind of just a showpiece really. Now our example is uh, for containment is that I have a notch that's really too wide and actually very close to center on purpose so what's going to happen is, is this is going to start to drift toward the notch because there's so much space here there's no negative surface area to hold it in place it's going to start moving toward the notch and it's going to start creating that nippling effect which we really don't like so much so uh, we're going to do a fail on purpose just so you can kind of see what what goes on. Unfortunately the notch is toward me but uh, doubtful will get a call anyway. So we're going to 
to get in position. Starting to bind because it's actually going right into the notch and filling in the notch and it's starting to catch inside the notch already and it's starting to create if you could see it's starting to point up in that um, that nippling effect already there. and you can see the drift okay you can see actually that the hole started here. Can you almost see? This is kind of like oval. Alright? And the hole actually started here. And if you can hardly see, there's a shelf here of where the spindle actually started to move down and into toward this, uh, into the notch and burned in. So actually the hole, there's this circle here where it's actually just sat in there and started burning and that's really no good so you have to make sure you have enough negative surface area here your notch can't be too far in okay and it can't be too wide because it has to have it has to enclose it has to contain that's why I say containment and not just notch because it has to hold the spindle in place as well as give a place for the coal dust to collect all right without the spindle going into the place where the coal dust is collecting and destroy everything okay so there's our lesson and we're going to move on to the next variable so that was willow we've seen willow work so we know that it does work so there's our fail on purpose Okay, so our next example is going to be uh, pawpaw, and we're going to go over the variable of air, which is part of the fire triangle. So what we're going to do is we're going to do a close-up of the coal formation, and I really can't stress enough that if you really have a coal in there, a coal ember, you have to kind of just let it settle for a second and let it take off on its own and part of that process is it, it pulls in its own air in the notch and grows on its own okay so there's no need to rush if you rush you might destroy it and you don't want to do that so our core two devices are pop off all right and uh, I kind of have this set up where the camera is behind me, so this may be a little odd. But that's where the most light is. So pawpaw on pawpaw. All right. And I'm going to take my shoe off. And let's see. Hand brace. position. So I want you to get a good view of the notch filling. So obviously it was already mated and uh, the bottom was flattened from the steering. Plenty of speed, plenty of rotation. Alright, let's see what we got. So we got us a coal. Okay. 
and just let the air get to it. Let it form. I don't know if you can almost see it's starting to turn black on its own. The brown dust just starts turning black as the ember forms and grows. It oxidizes. Okay. All right. And as we take the board off, it gets more air. It can suck in air from 360 degrees now, not just the front. And it can really take off now. Okay? And there we go. Fuel, air, and temperature. Okay, next one. Okay, so our next variable is pressure. And uh, so some of the principal factors we'll go over are uh, sound changes, all right, which we've experienced a few. Um, when you first start doing your strokes, sometimes uh, the cell structure of the wood starts to compress and forms a glaze on the base end and uh, starts squeaking. And uh, if you've done this enough times, you can like really tell like what's going on. So one of the things you have to do is you have to really break through that. And what you do is you have to add more pressure. You got to really push down on that and break through that glaze, um, as it's sometimes called. Uh, so as that stuff starts to compress, you really got to bear down even more on it because you're only applying enough pressure to really just compress the cells and push them together. You really need to have to have stuff, uh, have that abrading friction tear pieces off now and have it start tumbling back and forth underneath the drill, uh, underneath the, the spindle, so that it can ignite as a coal ember. Um, again, uh, if you have a more fragile spindle, you're going to want less pressure and more speed and more rotations to kind of make up for that if possible. Um, but with these wood, solid wood spindles, you don't really have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about their fragility, okay? Because uh, that unilateral force should not bust uh, the wood spindles in half unless they are truly fragile um, of a very low density or something like that. So then you would have to really be careful um, so one of the things you really need more pressure for is uh, when you have a little bit more density, it's a little harder. And uh, the other thing is if you have a lot of surface area, okay, if you have a lot of surface area to deal with, you may need more pressure. Now, our core two devices today are made of rattan, okay, this is a really big rattan piece which was cut up and uh, cut into boards okay and these rattan pieces were actually some old um, Eskrima collie sticks that we use in martial arts I had some extras and I figure that uh, I use them for uh, some fire sets and surprisingly rattan works very good it's almost like the bamboo I like it so much. Uh, here's an, another little set. Here's a little base and a spindle. As you can see, this spindle, uh, here's the brace end and here's the base end. And the base end, the surface area was taken down. So it's a little smaller diameter than the rest of the spindle, if you could see. All right. 
because these spindles are actually pretty big. This one here, it's not only uh, eight inches long, but it's seven eighths of an inch in diameter, in thickness, which is two centimeters approximately. Okay, and so we're gonna give this one a shot. Because the surface area is so big, I say this one makes a good representative of why we need more pressure. All right, let's get this in place. Pressure hand brace, and I'm gonna use a shoe to kind of keep it in place. Nice and steady. I'm just going to warm it up first. It's warmed up, so I'm going to start bearing down with my body weight. As you can see, it's really moving around. It's moving around too much. So we're going to do something uh, to keep that steady. Ready? Watch this. A little unorthodox, right? But since I can't pin my board to the ground outside, I guess I gotta pin it this way. And it's my table, so I can do whatever I want with it. But I'm gonna finish this example come high water, ready? All right. Let's do that again. was a workout. That one. Let's carefully remove our, our base. Let that breathe. See what I'll go through? Just to teach you, I'll nail it to the board. I mean, uh, nail it to the table. So I want you guys to really understand this, okay? All right, on to the next. All right, so our next variable is temperature, which, as you know, is one of the components of the fire triangle, air, fuel, and temperature. So in order to increase temperature to get that critical 
igniting temperature so that the coal can start to oxidize the fuel. Uh, to increase that, you have to increase some other variables. So we have to increase pressure. We have to increase friction, basically. So we increase friction by increasing pressure, increasing the duration and the time of how long you go. You increase it with speed, and you increase it with the amount of rotations for the abrasion. Um, and you just keep on going, and you go and you go and you go. Get that temperature up. So it'll reach like five, six, seven, possibly 800 degrees at that critical igniting temperature, okay, depending on uh, what you're doing with those variables. So our demonstration woods now are tamarack, okay, which is an evergreen. And it's very, when you uh, actually start splitting tamarack, it splits very, very nicely. It splits right along the grain. It's very even. It's one of the nicest splitting woods I've ever seen. Okay. Here's another small section of it. There's two bases that we have here. One's thicker than the other. We're going to use the smaller one. Our pressure hand brace is also made of tamarack, which I always like for it to be the same material. Everything's rounded. Okay. There's just enough there for my fingers and sit in that palm. Now my spindle, unfortunately, happens to be fairly short. In fact, it's uh, less than three and a half inches. It's less than nine centimeters. All right. So I'm gonna be using a small bow for this, my small uh, bamboo one, to try and get this going. All right. Got the notch toward you. I flattened the sphere of the base end already. It's all mated. Alright, so we got that strong. Now, the base is kind of small, so I'm going to use a shoe again. I'm going to try and keep everything steady. This, well, I knew that was happening. And that's something you'll always run into with small spindles, is that they're a little harder to control, so they flip out on you all the time. Obviously a larger spindle is going to give you more leverage for you to be able to control. All right. Let's do some warm up strokes with this. You make sure I keep my pressure hand brace level so it doesn't flip out again. More time. Okay. All right. Some warm up. Don't get frustrated. Don't get frustrated. Just keep going. Keep going. Don't get frustrated. Okay. I guess you can get frustrated, just don't get mad. Oh, almost. 
we could probably light that up. Don't get frustrated. See, I don't mind having to put the spindle back on the cord. It's just that it's hot. It's getting shorter. So I made a new spindle. <laughs> this one's definitely taller. See the difference? More pressure, more speed, more rotations. our coal. So actually that was our lesson. Keep things in balance. Even a little thing like height. Okay. Look at that. Twice the height allowed me so much more control. All right. And then we got it on the first shot with the new spindle. So keep things in balance, get that temperature raised to that igniting temperature and get that coal, get that fire. All right, next one.
All right, so our next variable is back and forth, also known as uh, reciprocation. And the physics of how friction, wood friction fire works, is that it's necessary for the wood to go back on itself, to go back and forth. If it just goes in one direction, that really just doesn't tumble the um, abrading, abrasion dust from the friction to get it to ignite. So it needs to go back on itself and tumble under there. So uh, uh, the problem is, is that the unilateral force from the bow um, makes things very unstable, especially a small little base like this. Uh, our set uh, today is going to be some cottonwood from out west. In fact, I think it was from uh, Zion National Park. Our spindle's a little short. It's uh, four and a half inches or about 11 and a half centimeters. But our board is going to be a little hard to control. So I'm going to definitely wear my shoe to kind of keep that going. So, but with the, um, with the great discovery of the bow and the cord together to get a friction fire going um, was truly uh, remarkable. However, it did come with this major upgrade complication, which is the unilateral force, which really throws everything off. A lot of times if you can't get the base really stable uh, the coal just gets destroyed it just it just can't form so one of the things that does help is the coal transfer device if that is moving with the base that can help keep it steady but still it's it's still considered quite unstable all right can be really tough the other thing that can happen is uh, another kind of drift which is an oval hole okay now if you don't start your spindle with a point uh, on an axis like this all right let's say uh, you have a flat base like it's a hollow uh, you can't make that right to the base right because it doesn't have a point you have to carve out a divot and get it to mate that way well a lot of times uh, after you mate this Okay, with the unilateral force, what it does is is it burns forward, and then it burns backward. It burns forward, it burns backward as it spins. So it spins forward and burns that way. Then it pulls back, and burns backward. And what it does is is it widens the hole, and it turns the hole um, into something oval as it stretches because it burns forward, it burns backward, it burns forward, it burns backward, it burns forward, it burns backward, and then you have this big wide gap, and then it's not stable. Then the spindle is actually bouncing around back and forth inside this hole. So that could be a major complication too. Um, you would probably have to remate everything at that point and then get it centered better. Uh, another thing you can do when that happens is if you are able to do this is turn the base or change the uh, direction of the bow okay so let's say you're bowing this way and you start to get the oval forward and backward if you can't alter the base a little bit all right if you can't do that you may have to actually throw your bow out to the side this way and do it this way that might be really really uncomfortable and it'll zap your energy and it's using muscles in a way you're not really supposed to use. But um, if you're close to a coal, you may be able to pull it off. If you're not near getting a coal, stop what you're doing and do everything all over again. Okay? You can't be lazy about it. If you see something is not going to be in balance and you realize that it's going to take a lot of work, stop what you're doing and fix it. Okay? Even if it's during that during phase, just, just, you know, stop what you're doing and just take care of it. So, however, if you're like seconds away from igniting a coal, maybe you could pull that off. 
So change the angle of the base or change the angle of the way you're bowing and see if you can't stabilize that spindle better inside. Keep it from making that oval worse or worse, you know, the spindle coming out and flying out like we've seen before. All right, so even our pressure hand brace is this little piece of cottonwood. All right. And what we have here is a small little uh, um, mouth drill hole that was started before. So what we're going to do is, is we're going to actually just fit this spindle in here and see if we can't just slide it up since our uh, pressure hand brace has already made it and everything. We may only get one shot out of this base and hopefully because it's so small I'm able to keep it steady due to that those unilateral forces of the back and forth. So let's see how this goes. We're going to use the small bamboo bow. Definitely going to have my shoe on. Help keep that steady. Oh, look at that move. That, I could, I mean, right off the bat, we should not continue at this point, right? Now, I can't pin it to the ground because I'm not outside. So guess what we're going to do? Yup, you, you betcha. We're just going to hammer that sucker down. All right. Let's see if this does the trick. Hopefully that nail won't get in our way. <laughs> Let's get some warm up strokes. I'm angling it backward a little bit because I think it might actually burn into the notch. So I'll burn it away from the notch if I can. The cottonwood is fairly low density. This should light up well. All right, let's see what we got. Grab everything as a unit. Come off carefully. We definitely got us a coal. Now I could tell you, there was no way I was going to pull that off without stabilizing the board from those unilateral forces of the back and forth. No way. That would have just thrown everything all over the place. And there we go. Alright, next one.